Uh, one is <coughs> rather speculative stuff around mystical seizures in the context of epilepsy. And the other is where I'm a little bit more at home, which is some quantitative assessment of religiosity in Parkinson's disease. Um, so, does this work? Uh, maybe mm. not. Would you like no, me okay, to do the... Okay. No, no, no. Okay. Good. So, um, I hope this isn't saying anything too startling, which is to say that the brain should necessarily be involved in uh, religious experience and the religious life, doctrine and practice, and that brain diseases may interfere in those brain mechanisms. And therefore, if we look at brain diseases, we can understand something about how the brain is involved in the normal religious life. That's my motivation, because I've been uh, indoctrinated through my profession to be a kind of neurological anatomist. So why would anyone who's primarily interested in religion be interested in this matter, this business? And I think it's because, and I hope I'll be able to demonstrate this, that looking at brain diseases allows us to fractionate the religious life in interesting ways. And if that sounds a bit obscure, I hope it will become clearer later on. So uh, my interest in this comes from a particular patient, uh, and I'm going to touch on this briefly. So this is someone that I was asked to see in a regular neurology clinic because she was refusing to see a neurologist who did not believe in God. Um, and actually all of my neurology colleagues do not believe in God. So I was tracked down and she's given me permission to tell her story. She's given me permission to actually name her, which I think is slightly alarming and I'm not going to do that because she is actually an active theologian still now. Very involved in the academic study and the authentication of miracles on behalf of the Catholic Church. So her interest in God stems from episodes which she's had since her teens of suddenly feeling at peace without any clear reason associated with these feelings, illumination, contentment, and her understanding that's evolved over time that these were a gift to her from God. Uh, and a particular incident that she describes that led her to believe these were a gift was when at the age of 17 some nasty boys showed her some pornographic material which was very offensive to her and upset her. <coughs> and within minutes she had one of these episodes of feeling at peace and content. And she interpreted this as God interfering in her life to get rid of this unpleasantness. Um, now the question that she came to the neurology department with was not of her, but from the community, the religious community in which she was now a life confessed member. So part of her community uh, was unhappy with her behavior and felt that she was pathological, that she had some disease, in particular that she had epilepsy. And uh, so this is very famous, and I no doubt many of you will know this, but to briefly rehearse, uh, Dostoevsky had epilepsy, and in the character The Idiot, or Prince Mishkin, in the book The Idiot, Dostoevsky describes the feelings provoked by his seizures and a key neurological point to make here is that the seizures that people will be familiar with as convulsions that you see on the television are due to the synchronous electrical firing of the whole of the brain and people don't experience anything during that they're unconscious but seizures like that can be triggered by abnormal electrical activity in one part of the brain and for a brief period of time the as it were healthy other bits of the brain can experience what it is like for one part of the brain to be inappropriately firing and that's called the aura of an epileptic seizure 
And what uh, Prince Mishkin describes is the aura when the temporal lobe, he didn't know this, but we can now say this, the temporal lobe is active and the rest of the brain is aware and healthy. So in the aura before the convulsion, Prince Mishkin experienced all his doubts and worries being composed in a twinkling, culminating in a great calm, full of sense of harmonious joy and a blinding inner light. So episodes very similar to what the theologian who came to see me was describing. And I thought you might be interested in this. So as, as far as I know, this isn't published. Uh, you have to be awake late at night and on some pretty dubious online chat rooms to take this down. So this is status epilepticus, or partial status of someone with a mystical seizure. So what I mean by that is that this person, whose identity I do not know, describes in real time online, and I watch this unfold, what it is like to have the aura of a temporal lobe seizure. And the time stamps for the entries in the online chat room. And what I want you to see is that the, the, the language is very clearly well written, it's well typed to begin with. And this person says, here's the aura, and the fit's going to come later. Um, smell starts it, people will may be fam familiar with the fact that a temporal lobe seizure is often preceded by a strong smell, like burning herbs. And then the language starts to break up, and you get this uh, ecstatic feeling. Grammar's not so good. We're losing the capitals. And we get language that, in other contexts, might well be described to be the language of a mystic. I can see the colours now. <coughs> you contain an infinity of shade, tone and chroma, chapter and verse. It's hard to exactly understand what this person is describing. I break open like a chrysalis, I split. You are the divine. I would be a river if I could. I would bleed eternal divine. And down here, the colours never leave us. God is spectrum, infinite spectrum, sound, colour, touch, all a spectrum. Then a gap of 14 minutes, and then now language restored. I had the fit, I'm fine, except I think I hit my elbow. So this is a prolonged real-time account of what it is like to have one of these Dostoevsky or mystical seizures. And these are the features of them. Uh, this list uh, was started by James Loiber in his classic text, and I've added a couple to them. And one of the questions that uh, I find interesting is to what extent we can say these core elements amount to a religious experience, or whether there's something more that's required to make this truly religious. Uh, in the neurological literature, that is not closely examined, and these are often described as religious seizures. But uh, in a very small study, <coughs> but the biggest study there is to date, of 11 patients uh, with ecstatic or mystical temporal lobe seizures, um, five of these 11 people describe them as having some spiritual component. But I'm more interested in what the others, as it were, said. So four actually said they were erotic. Um, and that interests me because of my you know, very amateur understanding that a lot of mystical language from times past could be understood in erotic terms. And then several of these patients couldn't find the words to describe what they'd experienced. Two of them said there was no way that a human could explain what I had experienced. Um, and eight out of these 11 patients actually 
induced seizures in themselves, either by not taking appropriate treatment um, or by putting themselves in situations where seizures would be triggered. So these are pleasurable to the majority in this small series. <coughs> so I go back to my patient and on the basis of what I've told you and an EEG, which is an electrical recording of brain activity over the scalp, told her that she has epilepsy. And then we have this interesting exchange, which is really what sparked my interest, because she then and now says it doesn't matter her whether this is epilepsy. She's quite convinced that God is speaking to her through these episodes. Uh, I you know, carry on in my crash way and say, you know, uh, don't worry about it, I can get rid of these experiences for you with <laughs> anti-epileptic <laughs> drugs. Um, and she has refused to take anti-epileptic drugs. So we have this interesting on pass. Um, she has uh, agreed not to drive, so that's good, and that shows some insight into the fact that this is epilepsy, um, but nonetheless is firmly fixed in not taking any medication. And my initial reaction, and you know, 80% of my core being says this is nonsense. That's just my visceral response, highly indoctrinated by my biomedical training, no doubt. Just my starting position. Um, sorry for all this text, but uh, I've, I've reread The Idiot several times, and the more I read it, the more that I find very profound in it. And uh, this is an interesting passage where Prince Mishkin reflects on the experiences he has and he's undecided about their significance. He recognises that they are due only to a disease and therefore because they're a disease they can't be a higher kind of life but a lower. So I'm with him there, as it were. But then he says but even if it is a disease and something wrong with the brain, when I recall what I've experienced, actually it seems to be one of harmony and beauty in the highest degree, overflowing with unbland joy and rapture. So there was indeed beauty and harmony in these abnormal moments. They really contained the highest synthesis of life. So in the character of Prince Mishkin, there is this conflict which uh, uh, is expressed by my theologian of being aware that these experiences are pathologically induced due to a disease and yet drawing deep significance from them. And uh, sorry about all this text, but Prince Mishkin goes on to say this is different from the intoxication of drugs. And I think, I think these experiences are different from drug-induced religious experiences. Um, because at least in those people who I've spoken to who have them, the significance of the seizures is long-lasting and persistent over many years. And except in a few rare cases, I haven't found that to be true of people with drug-induced experiences. The possible exception to that being psilocybin. So, now, <clears throat> I've said that Dostoevsky had these seizures himself and was describing, I'm sure, his own feelings. And in a letter to his brother, he says that he wouldn't exchange these experiences for anything. And in fact, Dostoevsky refused anti-epileptic treatment, which was bromide, so not a great treatment. Uh, so he's very much in the position of wishing to continue to have these experiences. And... Uh, there have been several other famous people with these, notably Karen Armstrong, um, who you will know, who um, had what she described as faints in her teens. She was admitted to a convent, well, she elected to go to a convent, that is to say, and these faints were interpreted in a religious way, and then she found a neurologist who treated them, and that coincided or happened at the same time that she lost her formal faith and she left the convent. Um, but Karen Armstrong writes that I would not have been without 
that time of having seizures because it gave me an intimation of such a heaven and such a hell that I would not wish to be without. So even she, who is hardly an orthodox believer now, has retained something of significance from these attacks. And I wonder, and this is very speculative, and actually as I heard you talk about your voice project, Chris, I wondered if you had similar thoughts. Um, now my training is to regard the <coughs> ramblings of a psychotic as of no meaning. My training would say that the voices one hears in a schizophrenic episode are, are clearly nonsense and not worth listening to. That's my training. And in a similar line, the experiences that people have with an epileptic attack are interesting anatomically, but are clearly should not be of any significance to the individual because they've been acquired through a disease. And yet I've encountered several people now who say these are very important to them. And I don't know whether these are truly authentic spiritual experiences or whether in some way the brain machinery around attributing significance or salience has also been tampered with by the seizure. And uh, I've gone back to William James who writes in, so you know the first chapter of his book is called The Neurology of Religion, it's right up my street. And he talks about how you distinguish between the real thing and something that is faking it, uh, the differential diagnosis. And of course you, you may well say, and you might well get to me in questions, well what business is it of yours to decide whether these are authentic or not? But uh, you know, doctors are trained to do this, we're trained to diagnose, so you know, this is my world. So uh, William James says, to remind you, that pretty much however hard you look at the event itself, you'll not learn anything about whether it's authentic. This is what I take from what he says. But it's by the fruits ye shall know them. <coughs> Classic Christian text. And that set me thinking, it set me thinking in these ways. So these people who have mystical seizures um, and believe them to be the word, not the word of God, believe them to be of God, you could regard as extremes of normal in this way. So the Alistair Hardy sort of question would, would reveal that about half of the normal population have some numinous experience. And most of those will have that once or twice in their life. I think those are about the figures. So we have a small cohort of people who have these experience on a daily or even more frequent uh, than that. So if, to put it really crudely, you know, if mystical experience is good for you, how super good must it be if you have it once or twice a day? And what are the fruits of that? So can we look at the lives of people who experience these attacks and say, what is the fruit of this super mystical life? That's the way my thinking goes. You can see all sorts of problems with that. But, um, so if we go back to this lady here, um, from me, looking outside in on her life, it, it is falling apart. There is very little good to be said for it. So she was on a train once studying the, some Jewish mystical text and woke up to find herself in prison in Cardiff because she had attacked someone on the train. Uh, she doesn't recall this, but she recalls going to hell during the train journey, which she attributes to the demonic influence of this Jewish text. Uh, uh, people around her said that she suddenly became very strange and in an undirected way was violent and so had to be restrained. And my interpretation is that she had a seizure and had an episode of post-seizure post violence, which is not unusual. Um, and I actually said, now come on, this has happened. You know, let's not mess around anymore. Let's put you on anti-epileptic drugs. You can imagine the patronising with a voice and the whole whole deal. Of course she wouldn't have anything of that. Uh, she continues, 
without anticonvulsants. But her life from the outside is descending into chaos, so she has been rejected or expelled by her religious community. Uh, she has a very unconventional uh, work life and romantic life. Um, but she does continue to function as a theologian. Uh, this is a, um, sadly it's an unpublished um, study from a while back of people with just temporal lobe epilepsy assessed with a, a standard questionnaire which revealed that in this US population people with temporal lobe epilepsy, not just those with mystical seizures but those with temporal lobe epilepsy, have much more frequent spiritual experiences and greater spiritual beliefs than the average US citizen, but have far less religious observance. So they go to places of worship far less <laughs> frequently, they read religious texts far less frequently. And this is the UK scene. Um, this is a, a small study of one particular congregation um, compared to people with temporal lobe epilepsy. And those with epilepsy were described in this paper as having a very cosmic or non-orthodox -religi non religion, spirituality, um, dominated by thoughts of evil and the miraculous and spirits, far more than the congregation, which was a liberal, liberal Anglican congregation, which possibly has the least awareness of those <laughs> aspects of a religious life than any. Um, but again, were chaotic, were infrequent attenders of places of worship, um, and actually in this uh, cohort, the psychotic elements after a fit tended to be more filled with uh, religious content than the aura or the, se or the seizure itself. So here's a funny thing. In, in the two studies of temporal lobe epilepsy, it's been suggested that 3% of people with temporal lobe epilepsy have religious seizures. Now, there are a lot of people with temporal lobe epilepsy. So if you do the math, as we say, 18,000 people in this country are having religious or ecstatic seizures. Yeah. Now, if that is true, uh, they're, they're surely they're not telling their neurologists, that's one thing. Uh, they may well not be telling their pastor or their family. And one of the things that's emerged in the work that we've done in this area, which isn't yet published, is that the more you ask, the more you find. Um, that may be true of your zone as well. Uh, so uh, I've now seen 18 people. Uh, so this is now the l largest world series of mystical seizures. Uh, I leave that. So I, I wanted to leave it there, really, just for this little <coughs> section. So from my point of view as a neurologist, the interesting thing is the experiment of nature that these seizures provide for us in anatomically localizing a place in the brain or a machinery in the brain that allows us to experience the numinous. And uh, sort of questions that arise from that statement is, well, does everyone have this machinery? Is it the same in everyone? Uh, what sort of conditioning is required in order to have this machinery, or is it present from birth? Um, that the religious life of people with this sort of epilepsy is, from my perspective, from the outside looking in, not a rich one. And therefore, I would say by William James's test, that being super mystical in this sense does not lead to fruits of the spirit in the life of these people. So by that test, I would say they were not authentic religious experiences. It is very curious to me that they are accompanied by this strong <coughs> sense of personal significance um, and salience. And at one level or other, I think we have to take that seriously, if only out of pastoral integrity. The uh, 
The question that we're trying to examine at the moment in a research study, and we don't have a, an answer, which is why I just leave it as a question, is um, to what extent we can say that these events are universal and stereotyped, and to what extent are they conditioned by people's upbringing. There's no doubt that the language people use in describing these events is very conditioned. Uh, so people will use religious language if they've had a religious background and vice versa. So to what extent are they authentically or intrinsically religious would be the question. So I'm going to move on completely differently. Is that all right? Mm -hmm. uh, this is now much more robust. That was a bit speculative. That may have made you cross. <laughs> uh, so this is about Parkinson's disease. Um, so I'll just remind you about Parkinson's disease. Uh, so this is a disease of the elderly. It occurs in all communities, all societies, and is primarily a disorder of movement. So people slow down, they develop a tremor, they develop this stooped posture, uh, and so on and so forth. Accompanying it is often depression, which may be intrinsic to the disease, or it may be a consequence of the social impact of having this disease. And there is also problems with thinking, which is definitely directly due to the disease's impact on the brain, with poor planning, poor memory, apathy, and in some people, but certainly not all, after many years, uh, frank dementia, but certainly not all. So it's a serious disease, it's progressive, there is no disease-modifying uh, disease treatment. And it has a particular anatomy. And for the sake of today, it doesn't really matter what that anatomy is, but it's focal. So there's depletion of a particular neurotransmitter in a particular part of the midbrain. The reason this is as interesting to me is because uh, my anatomical question, or neurological question is, well, does depletion of dopamine in this part of the brainstem, the substantia nigra, does that have any consequences for the religious life? Or is it completely irrelevant? That's the question. And you may say, well, why do we ask about that? Well, I mean, there clearly is an important pastoral point about if, if I get, or if my spouse gets, or if a member of my congregation gets Parkinson's disease, what might I expect in terms of the, the, the effects on their spiritual life? Uh, and if we see a change, is that due to a direct effect of damage in the basal ganglia, this part of the brain, or is it an indirect thing? And then, these are questions which a pastor might be more interested in, is if I have a faith and I get Parkinson's disease, does somehow that faith help me? Uh, or even if you have a particular model of religious faith, might there be some post-traumatic growth? Might there be some flowering of spirituality in the context of this serious illness? So we set about to try and answer these questions. Um, and an important point is that we recognize, and you, this isn't exactly rocket science, is that there are many ways in which people's spirituality could change in a disease like Parkinson's disease. There could be some very selective impairment of religious cognition, and we might see a specific effect on religiosity. But also there may be various non-specific uh, causes of a difficulty leading the religious life, not the least <coughs> something simple like the inability to move very well means you don't get to your place of worship. Now, I stress that because the only other literature in this zone is from one group in Boston who have repeatedly made the claim that there is a selective deficit of religiosity in Parkinson's disease. So in the United States, if you're diagnosed with Parkinson's disease now, you'll get a leaflet which tells you that your faith may well suffer because of this disease as a direct effect of the disease on your brain. And we are critical of these studies because of the controls that are used. So 
In the two studies that had controls, two didn't have controls. In the first, the controls were healthy people. And in the second, people who had health conditions, including high blood pressure and high cholesterol, which wouldn't have a direct impact on the patient's mobility or um, uh, life opportunities. So we would regard these as inadequate controls if you want to make a claim about the specific change that occurs in Parkinson's disease. And so we have done a smaller study, but I hope you'll agree better controlled, of 42 people with mild to moderate Parkinson's and controls who all have some limiting condition <coughs> that affects their mobility, either joint disease, lung disease, or blood vessel disease. And unlike the Boston papers, these are people who are not selected on the basis of any religious commitment. But the design of the study was to provide internal and external controls. So we studied them all at baseline, and then we repeated study at year one. So we're looking to see within the cohort of Parkinson's disease whether there was any change over a year as an internal control and then comparing those with Parkinson's disease versus our disabled non-neurological controls as an external control. And we did these tests and uh, I've, I've sort of got into the world of measuring religiosity, which I dare say people here will understand. Uh, and uh, it's quite difficult. Um, the rightly or wrongly, this is what we have used. And uh, I'll just briefly go. These are questionnaires that participants fill out themselves, although I think it's best done, as we've done, with some guidance as they go through the question. And there are several zones. So these are the sort of questions around positive spiritual experiences. Uh, I feel God's presence so frequently. Uh, negative spiritual experiences, that is about feeling that God uh, is cross with us because we've sinned. Um, nice bit on forgiveness. Religious practices, so do you meditate? Do you go to church or some place of worship? Do you get support from the people around you in the congregation? Do people in the congregation demand too much of you? Interesting question. Uh, and then we did this uh, life inventory. You may not be able to see this, but this, this tries to plot people's own feelings of what's important in their life and whether they're on track with it. So... Uh, in, uh, in our results, patients with Parkinson's that are in grey, uh, the controls are in white, and this is the baseline. I just want to show how well matched these two groups are at the start of the process on these schools of spirituality, um, which uh, I, in reality I think just means it's not terribly sensitive. Um, this is each individual patient, uh, so here the, the filled diamonds of people with Parkinson's and the cross hatching is people who don't have um, Parkinson's and although these are well matched as I've just showed you at the individual level it's hard to score a high score with Parkinson's it's much easier in other ways and actually this was all around mobility so even though our Parkinson patient were on a cruise score matched for mobility with the non neurological disabled controls. Our Parkinson's patients are not getting to places of worship as frequently as the others. Um, they're more socially isolated. So these are the non-religious measures of many. Um, <coughs> over the course of a year, people with Parkinson's, uh, sorry, I should just say, so the first two blocks here are people with Parkinson's, year zero, year one. Uh, they were coloured before my train journey today. Um, these are the controls, year zero, year one. And what, what we see, what you expect, is that over the course of a year, people with Parkinson's disease experience worsening of mobility by a little bit. Um, 
These patients do not because they tend not to have progressive conditions, they're rather stable. And people with Parkinson's experience a worsening of their memory over the course of the year. So uh, we thought this was quite nice because we now have some nice um, controls to see what would happen to spirituality. So if patients uh, with Parkinson's have a change in their spirituality, we could potentially attribute this to change in mobility or change in memory. And we had planned this rather complicated um, multiple regression analysis, which would tease out what the change in spirituality would be associated with. Uh, and I bought the statistical package and all the rest of it. But it turned out to be completely unnecessary because uh, in no measure did our patients with Parkinson's disease have any change in their level of spirituality or religiousness, in, in no measure. The only change was actually in the controls, and that was a reduction in the total score of religiosity in the controls over a year, um, which was attributable to, largely, not completely, a reduction in religious practices around meditation and prayer in the controls. So, uh, we conclude from this that this study does not confirm what was found before, that it does not show that Parkinson's disease leads to a change in spirituality. Of course, this study could be criticised, we don't yet know what the truth is, but we feel this is a useful addition to the literature because, in our view, the controls are better than the previous study. Now, that's kind of where my uh, work on this would end. But the person doing it with me felt this was all rather inadequate and wanted to do some qualitative work. And so she, at the end of all of her assessment, she uh, had a semi-structured interview with the patients, which was then, uh, which was recorded, it was transcribed, and then analysed in ways which I don't really understand. And I'm not going to propose to show you that, but... Some of the quotes from the participants was really very rich, and I just want to, in a few minutes, show you what they said. So, if you asked the participants directly whether their faith had been changed by having Parkinson's disease, most said not. Three of the Parkinson's patients did feel abandoned by God, and that would be a quote there. But a lot of the patients felt an increased interest in spirituality. So this person who, who would be agnostic at the outside uh, said that the experience of having Parkinson's had made him more interested in faith uh, because of the sense of impeding uh, disaster coming in the progression of the disease that he felt he ought to acquire some skills now and knowledge to cope with what was to come. This Buddhist was interesting because um, she found the whole questionnaire very difficult because it kept referring to God and she found that a difficult concept. And uh, that just reminded us of how inadequate some of these measures are. Uh, but she described the interruption of her meditation by the uh, shaking of Parkinson's and how disabling that was, which isn't something I had thought of. Um, all of the patients that we interviewed were very open to these discussions. Of course, perhaps if they hadn't been, they wouldn't have agreed to participate. Um, but this and others had some positive things to say about the experience. Um, and then these really very uh, strong affirmations of the life of uh, the spiritual religious world, even from those who didn't have a formal religious affiliation. And a really nice comment here. My faith is an anchor. It helps me through difficult times. It's a good feeling, I think, to have a belief because otherwise you've got nothing. So that is all I had to say on this and then perhaps we can have some discussion. So uh, at the level of th this study, we found no evidence to support the claim that Parkinson's disease affects faith. Um, and anecdotally, for some patients, uh, having a faith did allow for coping um, and provided solace. So, 
those were the two things I wanted to share with you, and I'd be interested to have a discussion around them. Thank you.